What is it like to stand inside a tornado and fireproof bunker, finished out like display cases at Tiffany's Jewelry Store, that has $7 million worth of whiskey in it? Well, I can tell you, it's awe-inspiring. Meet Dwayne Poor. Do not let the last name fool you. Dwayne is anything but poor. He's a self-made man that started off roofing houses and working as a fireman, but later he explored his entrepreneurial tendencies. He has an amazing career as a businessman that leases out equipment used in open heart surgery. He is also a certified tobacconist and has an investment in OKC's top cigar lounge. He's a real estate investor and has many other business endeavors. The most interesting endeavor of all has been his pursuit of rare and expensive bottles of whiskey from around the world. Dwayne has one of the largest whiskey collections in the United States with a bottle count somewhere around 6,500 bottles and an estimated value of about 7 million US dollars. How does one acquire such an amazing collection? Rapid acquisition of bottles, pulling together resources from other like-minded collectors, and developing a network of friends from the distillery level all the way down to the local retail stores that sell the product. It's easy to see why so many people have been willing to step up and help Dwayne collect his whiskey. He's affable, and generous, with no signs of the pretentiousness that you would expect from someone in his position. While I normally attempt to produce a podcast in such a way that the content is equally enjoyable on YouTube as it is on a podcast player, this episode may be the one that you want to watch as opposed to just listen to. That is, if you want to see the bottles and the bunker. I apologize to the viewers slash listeners for the static in the background when the on-location recording begins. Normally, my filming is stationary. I purchased new wireless transmitters so that we could move freely around the bunker, and the quality of the sound was affected. I would like to say a special thank you to Oklahoma Bourbon Connoisseurs, a Facebook-based whiskey group, and specifically its leader, Justin Merrick, for introducing me to Duane. I'd also like to thank Andy Lash for handling videography for this filming, and I'd like to thank Duane himself for inviting us into his collection. Please enjoy. Hello, Bourbon Real Talk listeners and watchers. So we're back for the second edition of the $7 million whiskey collection with my good friend, Dwayne, with the ironic last name, Poor. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I made jokes about that, Dwayne. It's pretty funny. It's, it's pretty funny. So Dwayne has one of the largest whiskey collections probably in the United States, and he's such a gracious guy. And see, I'm more interested in people. And so last time I came, I did a podcast about you as a whiskey collector, and everybody complained that I did it wrong. Apparently, I was supposed to show them the whiskey. They like whiskey. They like to see the bottles. And so <laughs> you have been gracious enough to let me back into one of your two vaults, and you've actually taken me to both vaults, and we're going to talk about some of the most special bottles that you have. Okay, so let's give them a little bit of background information. So... Anytime someone meets somebody that has a really stellar whiskey collection, everyone wants to know, what do you do for a living? Well, I have been an entrepreneur most of my life, but what I do for a living is I'm a cardiovascular perfusionist, which means I set up and operate the heart-lung machine for open-heart surgery, and I've been doing that for 27 years. So that living has allowed me to do things I love to do and start other businesses and have other projects that make me more money to allow me to do the things that I love passion-wise, which is whiskey. Right. Mostly scotch and a little bourbon. I have about uh, 5,500 bottles of scotch and about 1,000 bottles of bourbon at this time. Unopened. And unopened, yes. Uh, but uh, many open bottles. Now, one yep. of the very interesting things about you as a collector is that of those 5,500 bottles, or I, I think total your total bottle count is where? 6,500. 6,500? How many of those have you never tried? Maybe three. I've got three that are one of one, and I've never opened those bottles, but everything else I own, I have tasted at some point or time or place, and I may have actually traveled somewhere just to get to taste that whiskey. <laughs> uh, I traveled to uh, Missoula, Montana to a fundraiser for the University of Montana because I knew that the guy putting it on was gonna open a bottle of Pappy 25. Mm. So I got to taste Pappy 25 for the very first time at a fundraiser. We raised money for a great cause for the creative writing department. And he was gracious enough to open about 45 to 50 bottles of whiskey 
a lot of bourbons and a lot of scotches, stuff going back into the 50s and 60s. Wow. And so got to try a lot of different things at that point. So kind of kept a record of when I first started of, okay, I've got this bottle, but I've never tasted it. Okay, this bar has it. I'm going to travel to this bar so I can taste that whiskey. I want to taste it. Right. And then I got to uh, farther in the future. I had a couple buddies and that collect as well. And so we always buy an extra bottle just so we can open it and drink it. That's, that sounds like a solid plan. And so one of the things that people don't realize about whiskey is that whiskey, especially in the last, say, 10, 15 years, have been appreciating in value. And so you can get into the hobby at various levels, right? You can get you into can. the hobby just as a drinker, and you can get into the hobby as a moderate collector, and that can get expensive. But if you could buy in large enough volumes, you can almost pay for your hobby Right. With the increase in the value of the bottles that you don't open if you buy enough of it. Especially uh, well, going back in time, if we had a time machine, of course, you could take a, a typical 49 or $50 bottle in 2008 to 2010, fast forward to 2020, and that bottle's worth $1,600 or $1,700. And if you bought multiples of them, mm -hmm. you could still keep one for your collection, keep one to drink, and sell the rest to buy another bottle that you want to add to your collection. And I do that a lot. I try to do a lot of trading for things that I have that someone else wants. They have something I want. We just swap bottles. Gotcha. And, and sometimes it's wholesale for wholesale, retail for retail, and sometimes it's secondary market for secondary market. And once you get to that level where you've shared your passion with a lot of people, people come to you with opportunities whenever they find rare whiskey. And so I want to talk about some of those things. And it kind of goes back to that point of if you acquire enough whiskey, you can actually pay for your hobby with the bottles that you end up not not purchasing. And so you've got a really interesting bottle up here. I do. Um, so I'm going to allow the cameraman to get kind of close up on this if you're interested. So if you look real close to the glass, you can see that there's little gold veins that are running all over the glass. And this is the... Uh, we'll call it the great grandfather of what we commonly refer to as OWA, although they've taken the old off of the label. It's now just Weller and well T, but right. we still call it OWA. And this is a squat bottle, but this is Weller Gold Vein from the early 80s. And uh, tell us a little bit about the history of this bottle. So I had that bottle on the shelf up high there. I had this bottle here in my vault, and I invited a friend to come over, and he came in and he says, you know... I think I have a bottle just like that at my house. So he goes home, digs in his closet, and pulls this bottle out and brings it up and says, here, it's a gift. You have one, I want you to have another one. So I get to looking at the bottle, and so you guys know that collect these. These go for well over $1,000 now. Right. It still has the original price tag on it, where it was sold here in Oklahoma at $14.49. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he paid for it. I'm guessing probably in the late 1980s. Right. And so that's what makes this hobby interesting is because if you have a little bit of foresight and enough passion and the capital to invest, you know, if you had bought a case of these when they came out and you drank a couple of them over the years and you traded some of them over the years, you will have drank some amazing whiskey absolutely for free absolutely. and ended up with great stuff in the end. That's right. And that's what makes it fun and the people you get to share it with. So um, in the same group of friends, we're having a whiskey tasting one night. And behind his bar, he has the 10-year-old version of that. Uh, and I had never seen a 10-year-old. Mm. And so he had it open behind his bar. Not for long because we drank it all. But uh, to get to taste something like that and share something like that in the 7, 8, 10, and 12-year-old range from the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, it's very hard to find. So it's great to be among a crowd of people where sure. you can – everybody gets to taste it and everybody gets to try it. Just that makes out of it fun. The, do you know Randy Blank that lives in Houston? I do. He has the Blank and Winkle that's yeah. in that bottle. Yep. So amazing. And he <laughs> brought one and let me try it. and It was, it was, it was lights out. It was great. That's great. And so if, if you uh, look up here, you're just going to see verticals of Pappy Van Winkle, Family Reserve Rise, 20s, 25s, uh, well, not 25s up here, 20s, 23s. You have just tons of Pappy Van Winkle, and a lot of it is the older Stitzelweller juice. Now, most of it's pre-2012. Pre-2012. Um, last time I came, I let you try a, a current release of the Pappy uh, 20, and... 
2019, I believe is what it was. Yeah, it and was. it tasted like it had been finished in a dill pickle barrel. <laughs> it was <laughs> terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> it tastes like a, a, a dirty martini. It's, it was it's awful. Weird. But the older <laughs> stuff is great, and that's what you have a lot of. And so, but your main passion and what really got you into this was scotch. That's right? correct. And so, right behind us, we have some special bottles of scotch. And so, uh, which of these would you say is probably your most valuable individual bottle? Well, let's start with my oldest. Okay. So, the, the first most expensive bottle that I ever bought was, uh, this is a 70-year-old Glenlivet bottled by Gordon and McPhail. Gordon and McPhail is a company out of Elgin, Scotland, that starting back in the 20s and 30s would buy casks of whiskey and put them back and hold them and taste them through the years so they thought they were good enough. In this particular instance, this was the oldest whiskey ever bottled at the time, at 70 years old. They got 100 bottles out of that uh, sherry butt, which, you know, 650 liters. They got 100 bottles and a few samples. So I was in Las Vegas, the Universal Whiskey Experience, and got a chance to taste this and got the opportunity to purchase it. And when I purchased it a few years back, it was in the eighteen dollars to $20,000 range. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's appreciated quite a bit in value. So this was the first most expensive bottle that I bought. And I say that because I buy, you buy a $20,000 bottle, you have a handful of people in the world that if you ever wanted to resell it, you could resell it to. Sure. Truly only a handful of people in the world that you would open it with. Right. But if you've got a three or $4,000 bottle, you've opened the market even more, and a $1,000 bottle even more. So when you're collecting and you're buying whiskey, thinking about that for the future, think about is it going to be easy to sell or harder to sell in the future. So mm -hmm. I limit the number of really expensive high-end bottles and try to find them more moderate. So that being the first most expensive. The second, I bought this before I bought this, mm -hmm. but value-wise, that is the McAllen Millennium Malt from 1949, bottled in 2000 at 50 years old for the Millennium. When those first came out, they were around $2,000 a bottle. They're currently selling for between 35 and 40,000 pounds per bottle. So the price has certainly gone up for some that started out around $2,000. Got a copper top for when you take the cap off. If you ever decork it, you can put the you copper, put the, that crystal on there. and copper on it. So beautiful decanter, uh, beautiful boxing. And actually, there's a piece of foam under it that sets all the way down in the box and protected by the foam. Oh, wow. But uh, so that's the first bottle I bought. But then it wasn't expensive. It was $2,000. Right. And it's now hit that forty to $50,000 range, thirty five to 40,000 pounds. Okay. So it's gotten a lot more expensive as time goes on. It's sure. a 50-year-old McAllen. Beside it is a 65-year-old McAllen in the green box. Mm -hmm. And that's a 65-year-old McAllen, part of the Six Pillars series. It's in a Lalique decanter, and that sells for between fifty and 70000 U.S. dollars. Wow. So that's one of those, you know, stumbled on a great deal and couldn't turn it down and wanted to add a really old McAllen to my collection, and I was able to do so with that bottle. Right, right. And so, and, and, you've, and you've tasted both of these whiskeys? Yes, I've tasted. I have, uh, matter of fact, when I bought the McAllen Millennium, I bought 10, and we immediately opened one to uh. drink it. Uh, <laughs> and then I've been able to try it again. They, ha they have it, had it, and probably still have it behind uh, the bar at the Prime Steakhouse at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. It's the only place I know of in the U.S. that, that has that one. Oh, my gosh. And with this one, I actually got to taste a sample of it before I ever bought it. And same with the 65. Uh, the six pillars, I got to taste that entire set in a sample kit uh, before I made an option to buy the box. Was that in Scotland or did you? That was in Las Vegas as well. That kind of seems to be the place that all the guys from Scotland end up at and all the guys from around the United States and all the global brand ambassadors pre-COVID would end up in, uh, in Las Vegas. It was kind of the universal place to meet. It was either there or in New York City. Gotcha. So uh, everybody loves coming to Vegas. Right. Now you have friends that are also huge scotch collectors. I do. Um, who would you say the biggest scotch collector is in the U.S.? Without giving a name, uh, there's a gentleman in Atlanta that probably has the most valuable uh, scotch collection in the country. I know of another gentleman in New York City, uh, another gentleman in um, Florida, and one in Arizona. And, and their collections uh, probably do not top mine in bottles, but top them in value. value right, because those are the guys that are buying the bottles that are the, 
they're one hundred fifty. Yes, you know, they're, yes. They're worth a whole lot more per bottle, and and end. and they're that's what they're after is 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 the really high end to build the collection and complete those sets. Gotcha. And they're all great guys, and they all are happy to share their whiskey. And when we get together, uh, it's a lot of fun. I we open some really great whiskeys. I could imagine. I could imagine. Uh, but we've got some other uh, bottles just over here to my left that are kind of interesting for the American bourbon collectors. So as excited as I am about your super expensive bottles of scotch that are totally rare and no one's ever going to see one again and all of that stuff. My podcast is Bourbon Real Talk. So I get pretty excited about bourbon. And you've got some pretty epic bourbons as well. I do. And so uh, let's talk about this guy right here. This is um, A. H. Hirsch. Can I pick it up? Absolutely. Okay. Right. The sixteen-year-old. Sixteen-year-old. We're gonna get a zoom in on that guy. And so, somebody not too long ago reached out to me and said, "Hey, I got a sample of A. H. Hirsch twenty-year. Have you ever heard of it?" And I was like, "Yeah, a little." There's a whole book about it called The Greatest Bourbon You'll Never Taste. <laughs> and we and, and just full disclosure, this is not his only bunker. He has another bunker someplace else that we have already gone to. And you do have the the A.H. Hirsch uh, 20 year there. With the wax top, the with, old one. With the wax top. Um, but this is the 16 year, and this one was special because it came in a kit, right? It came out in a uh, actual cigar humidor. So this is a glass top cigar humidor humidor with a lock. It has uh, a place to keep the humidity in and it has uh, a hydrometer in it to keep it measured. So basically you take the fluffy pillow out and season it and it becomes a cigar humidor. And they were sold as sets from A.H. Hirsch uh, when this 16 was first released. And I found this actually in the wild on the shelf right here in uh, the great state of Oklahoma. Wow. And this was one of those bottles probably, did you remember about what year that you bought this? I'm going to say it was about seven or eight years ago. Seven I'm, or eight years I'm ago. close to seven, seven yeah, or eight so years So for ago. those of you who are just getting into the whiskey collection market, things didn't really start getting super rare until probably 2015, 16. Mm -hmm. And before then, you could get stuff. And things like this would be a specialty release, very limited. But a lot of times, the liquor store would get it, and they wouldn't have a customer to buy it because, you know, it might have been $1,000 on release. And... There's a limited number of people that are looking for a thousand dollar bottle of bourbon, uh, but it, but but if you were one of the smart ones that bought it and you held or on lucky, to it, lucky yeah, or lucky, <laughs> uh, then then you ended up with a big win. So I can't imagine what this set would go for now, but um, I know that A. H. Hirsch, the twenty year, is is gotten up there quite high. They're both really moving high in the market right now. Yeah, yeah. And so, and then uh, one of the bottles that, you know, a lot of whiskey aficionados get real excited about is this OFC. Uh, it's a Buffalo Trace product. So the Buffalo Trace Distillery um, previously was the OFC Distillery. And if you go do the tour in the uh, marquees in the brick of the brick facade buildings, it still says OFC. And if you've ever read about Bourbon Pompeii, they found these um, uh, copper tank fermenters when they were doing some exca excavation. They were doing some renovations, and they figured out that that was where the OFC used to be made, and it's all been restored and all of that stuff now. And if you go on the hard hat tour, if you're lucky enough to know some people, you get to see that. And so you ended up with a bottle of OFC from, 2000, or, uh, from 1993, right? 93, and I also have a 94. It's not on display. So I was fortunate enough to, uh, to find that uh, the State of Oklahoma only got like five bottles or six bottles total. And so it's just being fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And, and when they put that on the shelf and happily got one of those. And then I found the 94 in another state. And haven't seen the 95 yet, but I've heard rumors. So a lot of people, they, they want to know how do you find this type of stuff? Because you have a lot of stories about being hooked up at, at retail for really epic bottles that other people would be looking for. And I've heard you explain before that with all of this time that you've been in the whiskey collecting game and all of these people that you've met from the actual distilleries in Scotland, that you sometimes have influence over what states get what distribution of product, right? And I think more over my own state, and, and it goes back to Scotch more than bourbon, it's the fact that Oklahoma's allocation for a particular bottle 
was one. We were going to get one bottle of the 100 that came to the United States. And I was able to, with my group of collectors, say, well, we don't want one. We want 12. We'd like to have 12 bottles in the state of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And because we were going to purchase all 12 of them, uh, we get them. And that started to become more and more of a trend that we're able to get some allocated stuff to the state that we've never had before. And so what we've done as a group, though, to be fair, is whatever the allocation was going to be before we asked it be increased, it was going to be one or two or four. We leave that one or two or four in the warehouse, and we just take the extra ones that we asked for so that whatever Oklahoma was going to get still goes on the shelves or still goes to the restaurants and trying not to be a hoarder or take advantage of it. But if we were going to get two cases and we asked for 10 cases and we end up with 10 cases, we still leave those two on the shelf to be allocated out to the right. store. And in that way, you get what you need without affecting anybody else in the state. And we still get it in the state and don't have to go out of state, and it stays in our tax base. Right. And, and the state, ABC, gets their taxes. Everybody wins. Everybody's happy. But it also makes you a good friend of a lot of the liquor stores. Yeah, because if, if I can encourage that and, and the liquor store is going to get that in for, for my group, whichever liquor store that may be, uh, then that helps them with their numbers as well because some of the bottles that we bring in are rather expensive and some are not but it's the fact that we have a collection or a set for example I'll give you uh, an example of Ardbeg every year Ardbeg does a fesh eel bottling a committee release one time every year they're going to make it once and never going to do it again Oklahoma had never gotten an allocation before 2016 and in 2016 we got our first allocation and we got like three cases we asked for please make that 12 cases because we would all like to buy, you know, five or six bottles because we're going to do tastings. We want other people to get to try it. And then we each want to put one in our collection so we have one for every year and maybe one to set back to drink. So now each year we're each getting a case being allocated to Oklahoma for that. Where in the past we didn't get that. So a liquor store that would never have gotten a bottle possibly will get a bottle. But there's going to be a lot more cases for the state. And this year we actually got like 10 cases of it. And that's really nice for the state when in the past it was zero and then it went to one case and two cases and it's slowly growing every year so we're getting a better reputation in central united states uh of being bourbon and scotch collectors gotcha well and the other thing is is that from the retail store's perspective if they're getting in say 10 cases of in, it, some of these bottles might be a thousand dollars and they're operating off of a 20 or 25 percent profit margin and you come in and all 10 cases get sold out the day that it comes in from the warehouse and they're making that 20, 25 percent. That's a big blessing to that local business. So that when they do get their OFC, who are they going to call? They're going to call the somebody in the group at right, least. Right. Yeah, somebody absolutely. In the group, somebody. And so that's how you build those relationships, because, you know, if you're out there and you're a whiskey collector, you need to understand that your value to the liquor store is as a customer. They're in it to be profitable. And so if you can find a way to make yourself valuable to that liquor store, now I don't go in and buy tens of thousands of dollars worth of scotch when it comes in, but what I will sometimes do is go into the liquor store and say, hey, I'm here to buy a bottle of vodka. Uh, I don't notice the difference in the different vodkas. And so why don't you tell me which one you have your pro highest profit margin on? And I'll just buy that one because I'm just going to mix it anyway and I won't be able to tell the difference. And sometimes you can endear yourself to these liquor store owners. And then, then, then the next time, that they get their shipment of Blanton's, they might uh, give you a call and let you buy a bottle, right? So <laughs> Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. So, um, But these bottles, they're impressive bottles. Some of these bottles have been very expensive, but you have a few bottles that are near and dear to your heart, right? I do. All right, well, let's go over and take a look at this guy over here. Everywhere I look, I see something that is beautiful in, in, in your whiskey room right? Uh, but this one really stands out to me. And so tell me a little bit about the history. So a couple of parts on this to, to this story, and it kind of follows in with what we were talking about before. This is bottle number 17 of 53 in the world of the Bowmore 40 year old. Okay. So I had a liquor store owner call me, so got one of these in. The United States only got like five of the 53, fortunate enough. And so I got the phone call and I purchased the bottle. So something special about this bottle, it comes in a box with this rock under it. Mm -hmm. Of the 53 bottles, each bottle, glass was blown, put out on a rock, and the bottle was rolled in it. 
So every single bottle has a different pattern on it. So all 53 bottles are different. Mm -hmm. Well, I was fortunate enough to travel to Scotland and was staying at the Glenmorangie House in Tain, Scotland. And one of the gentlemen at the um, house there, we were showing some pictures, different things we had, and he noticed this bottle. And he said, do you know that Brody Nairn from Glass Storm right here in Tain made those bottles for Bowmore? And I go, no, I would love to go by and check out the gallery. So the next day we go by and check out the gallery. And at this time, he is blowing these rocks and making them for a special event. Each one of these has a number, serial number, and a name on it for a special event. I commissioned him to make me a set of glasses, mm -hmm. a decanter, a water pitcher, and these were paperweights that he was making. He threw those in. So I commissioned him to make me a set of glassware to match my bottle. So this set is one of one. There's not another one like it in the world. And looking through his gallery, so money story, and most of his little tiny bowls and little cups and beautiful things were three and 4,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I did not know what I got myself into. Right. He and I had a great visit. We talked. We finished. I handed him my credit card. He wrote the number down. Eight weeks later, this shows up in the mail. Each one of these beautifully wrapped either in a black box with a white ribbon or a white box with a black ribbon. Absolutely gorgeous. And he, he sent those along with it. And my entire bill was 400 U.S. dollars. <laughs> so I'm like, the heart attack was spared. Right, right. And I got this beautiful one-of-a-kind set to go with my 40-year-old Bowmore. That is amazing. It's a lot of fun. And it's a testament to the fact that when you, you get together and you talk whiskey with people and you share their passion, sometimes just good things happen. It was a great conversation. We spent two hours watching him blow glass and watching his whole team work. And he actually had one of these bottles in his uh, glass case in the back. It was empty. Mm -hmm. And he's, I said, well, was that originally full? He goes, no, not with these people I work around. It would have been <laughs> empty in about a day. He goes, that was our test bottle. That was the first one we did to make sure that the process was going to work. Um, so there's actually 54 bottles in the world, but only 53 that have ever helped with whiskey. That have whiskey in yeah, them. Yeah. And so it, this is one of your most prized possessions. Um, everybody probably wants to know, what is your rarest bottle that you have? So it's behind you. Oh, okay. My rarest bottle is a bottle of, from William Grant & Sons, of the Balvenie Tun 1401, simply labeled A. Okay. So the 1401 series of tons, there were nine bottlings, one through nine. Okay. And... On each bottle, it tells the exact casts that were used to make the ton. So the ton is a giant vat, mm -hmm. and they take all of these different casts that are listed, and they pour the whiskey in it, and they let it marry together for three or four months, then they bottle it. So in this particular instance, there were eight or nine from, ton number, from batch number nine. There were eight or nine different bourbon casts and three different sherry casts mm -hmm. labeled A, B, and C. Well, they pulled some bottles to do a couple of tastings in Taiwan and the U.S. of the individual casks before they dumped them in. And they were able to do both tastings with only one of those two bottles. And so one of the brand ambassadors from the distillery gifted me this bottle, a very old, very dark, mm -hmm. straight from the cask, sherry cask, Balvini. It's priceless in my opinion. So uh, I'm going to turn 60 here in a couple of years, and I'm going to open that bottle and drink it on my 60th birthday. That is beautiful. So the rarest bottle you have that is priceless. One of one. It's going to be opened. It's going to be opened and drank. Yeah. It will be drank. Absolutely. That's and cool. uh, you're invited. No, I'm you, hey, I, <laughs> even though I, 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 and, and I, and I will admit to you and in my Viewers and listeners, they know that I've made jokes about I don't drink scotch because it tastes like treason. Uh, but I actually, <laughs> <laughs> and I only say that because uh, one night I was I was drinking uh, with I was drinking a bottle of Canadian whiskey that somebody had given me, and I didn't want to be drinking it, but I, I grew up poor, so I don't waste. And I was drunk like the third night in a row just trying to get rid of this bottle because I didn't want it in my house anymore. And I was sitting there and I was looking at the glass. And I was like, this is making me feel poor because I ha I'm like, I'm, I'm drinking something I don't want to drink. And I thought, Canadian whiskey makes me feel poor. And so I texted my buddy who got the other bottle at a group birthday party. And I said, I don't drink Canadian whiskey because it tastes like poverty. And I don't drink scotch because it tastes like treason. 
and that kind of became my tagline. But I do, I mean, I recognize uh, as a bourbon lover that bourbon probably would have never become a thing if scotch had not paved the way in the world of whiskey. And so I, I pay homage to the, the godfather of whiskey. And the other side of that, scotch wouldn't be as prevalent and we wouldn't have as much if it wasn't for bourbon because, because use we the use the casks. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> exactly right. right. So, yeah, I would, I would love to come and, and, uh, and check that out. Now, some of the experiences that you've been able to create have been uh, because of connections that you've made with individuals in the, um, in the whiskey world, uh, brand ambassadors, uh, master distillers, things like that. Uh, do you have any really awesome stories about you know, something that you have in your collection because of one of these connections that you've made? A lot, actually. Um, one of my favorite ones is uh, as I travel and I go to the different distilleries and I go to the different events, I get to meet the master distillers. I get to meet the brand ambassadors and the global brand ambassadors. And they become friends as well as colleagues. And uh, Dr. Lumsden, Dr. Bill Lumsden from Glenmore NG, so Glenmore NG and Ardbeg are, uh, they're both large whiskey companies and they're owned by Louis Vuitton Mont Hennessy. And Dr. Bill Lumsden is the master uh, distiller and whiskey creator. He makes the whiskey, it's his idea is what they come up with. And I've been trying to get him to come to Oklahoma forever. And finally he, he makes a trip and he comes to Oklahoma City and I invite him into this vault. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of Glenmorangies and I said, Dr. Bill, anything on the shelf that you wanna try, Pick it out and we'll try it. Mm -hmm. So he picks a 1971 25 year old Glenmore NG. He said, I've seen this one. It's one that I've never tasted. Mm -hmm. So we open the bottle and we drink it. And we get done. There's a little bit left in the bottle and he signs his name. Well, his protege is a guy named Brendan McCarran. And Brendan McCarran, at some point when Dr. Bill retires, will take over in that role. And fast forward a few weeks and Brendan's here and we drink from the same bottle. And I, got, I have uh, Brendan, Brendan sign the bottle as well. So I've got a, both their signatures on the bottle. But because of that relationship, my next trip to Scotland, I was able to taste some rare casks and things I had never tasted before. I let them taste one of my most prized possessions, and so I got to go into the distillery, into the dunnage, and open some casks and taste some whiskey straight from the cask with Brendan as our tour guide, and never would have gotten to do that had it not been for a simple collection and one small bottle in Oklahoma City one day. That is amazing. amazing. So that makes it a lot of fun. Um, and there is one thing over here that I want to show the people. So uh, earlier you were telling me about um, there's this tasting kit. Um, I'd love to get some video of this and maybe tell the people about this. So in 2012, uh, John Campbell, the distillery manager for Lafroig, was in Dallas, Texas, doing a tasting at a little liquor store down there. And I loaded up six or eight of my friends from here in Oklahoma City, and we're going to go down and we're going to meet John Campbell. I'd already met Simon Brooking. He was their global brand ambassador, and Simon was going to be with John, and he's actually the one that invited us down. And we show up, and they're doing a tasting of their basic 10-year-old and the triple wood and the 18-year-old. And, you know, I've got my friends with me, and we make a decision. So we go over to the store manager and ask him, will you sell us a bottle of Lafroy 25-year-old? at cost and we'll let John pour it for everyone. So we did and he said yes and so we got a 25 year old Lafroig 2011 cast strength edition the bottle and I took it to John and I said you can pour this for everyone that's at the event please pour it for my five or six friends and, and I. So he did he signed the bottle he signed the box and this is his tasting kit that he was using to demonstrate inside this kit is uh, some new make and a piece of a barrel and, and the barley will turn around. But when the night was over, he signed it to Dwayne, thanks so much, John Campbell, 1st of November 2012, and gave this to me as a gift for buying a gift of whiskey to share with everyone. And it wasn't about receiving anything, it was about meeting a great person and about sharing whiskey with, with the people that were at this event that showed up to support that brand, which is one of my favorite brands. So got to meet John, and we've uh, had a long-term friendship ever since. I've been to Isla a couple of times and, and shared dinner with him, and he's done some private tastings for us and some public tastings, and he's just a great person to be around, a great brand, a great company. So they've been around since 1815, owned by the Campbell family since 1815, 
and he's the first Campbell to ever be the master distiller there. Just celebrated 25 years, uh, the end of last year, being the distillery manager there. Wow, that's amazing. So, great person, great individual, makes a great whiskey. So we are in an undisclosed location. We are. I got to be honest, the first time I pulled up here, I thought for sure I was in a wrong spot. Um, but we're in a beautiful uh, bunker that has fire suppression systems and everything else. Whenever I told people I was going to be doing this, they were like, he's really going to let you video his, his $7 million whiskey collection? And so how do you, like, how do you secure something? Like so uh, we, have, we have building security. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have full camera system. The entire building stays on lockdown at all times. You have to key fob in or out. Um, we have our own security, and the building is fireproofed. Every part of it's alarmed. Every part of it, uh, in this particular build, room in this building is, is double secure. It's triple fire rocked. Uh, it's hard to get into, hard to get out of. Uh, there's lots of combinations and codes. <laughs> but security, and then also we have a great relationship with the police on this side of town, and and uh, they're all great guys, and it's just a phone call, and fire st uh, the police station is just on the corner. Right. So we got we, all these little things that we put into place when we decided we were going to put a vault in here uh, when we were building this building. My I've got a partner in the building, and he and I have a lot of fun doing that. And I'm like, I want to put my whiskey vault in our building. And he's like, okay, let's do it. Yeah. And so we went through the extra steps when we did the build out to, you know, to make it a metal room. And that, that's the big thing is that it's pretty much impenetrable. Could you come in here during a tornado? Is it that type of It's that structural? type of frame. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Wow. And so, great. you know, we're in Oklahoma, so you have tornado a, insurance and fire insurance yeah. and earthquake insurance because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's so, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, it is that kind of a bunker, and it's, uh, it's really nice to, to be able to feel secure when, when I'm away. All right, well, let's end on a positive note. One of your favorite whiskey tasting experience stories. Could be Scotland, could be here. I would say, and and I know that there's a lot. Let, I know let me just a lot, since but. we're here, let's go to here. Okay, uh, we're at Lafroy at the distillery, and we've done um, a Robert Burns night. And so Robert Burns was, of course, uh, a hero of Scotland. And there's a reading from a book called Tam O'Shanter, mm -hmm. and we've done the reading, and we've had this wonderful dinner, and we drank these wonderful whiskeys. And the sun's starting to set over the ocean. It just starts to rain a little. And Simon Brooking, the, the brand ambassador, uh, is there, and John Campbell's there. And it starts to rain. We go into the peat house, which is just like a three-sided open shed where they store all their peat to mm -hmm. keep it dry. And we're in the peat shed smoking cigars in the rain. And Simon, the little pouch they wear in Scotland. He pulls out a bottle and it's a 32-year-old Sherry Cast Lefroy that's at this time had never been bottled for anyone before. It's now been bottled. And he shared that dram with us, looking at the sunset across the ocean with a rain cloud above our head, raining in the peat house, smelling all the peat, smoking a cigar in Scotland with friends. That's a great experience. That is a great experience. Well, I'll tell you what, this has been a great experience for me. Thank you so much, Dwayne, for inviting me Thanks into coming, your Randall. whiskey vault. I hope that all of you viewers out there enjoyed it. If you want more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can get that at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. We're on Instagram. And if you would go to your favorite podcast player or YouTube and subscribe, like, comment, and review, that would help more people find this content. And always remember that if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Cheers. Cheers.